Hey, this is Raimu. This talk is going to be about some of the things that I learned as a longtime C++ developer when I decided to learn Rust. What are the things that are recognized from C++? What things were different? What kind of stood out to me as important to learn? And then what were the, some of the common mistakes that I made? My perspective as learning Rust, which was only about a month and a half ago, at first, looked pretty similar to what I already knew. I could read and understand the examples in the first few chapters of the Rust book, but looks can be deceiving, right? Lifetimes and borrow checking, to me, were very new, but also kind of welcome additions in a, in a certain sense because I thought that the strictness of the language was very appealing, that if we can catch more mistakes at compile time, we won't have to find them at runtime. How strange and strict they can be, though. Ran into a lot of compiler errors. Didn't understand how to deal with them until I got more and more used to it. So after some culture shock, I had the realization that strict can be good. The language does guide you towards better designs. Many times, once the compiler gives you its blessing, it just works, right? So a few concepts in particular stood out to me as important and different from other languages, particularly C++, and I'd like to talk ab about them today. Also, a few types of problems that I ran into seem to occur more frequently than others. So, my f initial approach to Rust was, let me form associations between what I already knew in C++ and what's in Rust. So I found these plentiful and readily available. So for example, void in C++ is the empty unit in Rust. All right, so what I learned which was different from C++ that I tried to focus on, some important things, were to embrace the patterns involved with enumerations and with match and if let and those kinds of constructs. So in this example, we are looking at the return value of a function called lookup. And this was a little bit strange at first, the syntax that you kind of have to read it, not from left to right, but kind of from right to left, where you're calling this function lookup with an argument and you get back something that has to match a certain pattern. In this case, it has to be a sum value for an optioning num. And then if it is, let's take a look at what's inside of that sum, which is that record. And the match in Rust, very similar to the C++ switch, right? Instead of uh, cases, we have these arms where we ha have more flexible and powerful matching syntax. But otherwise, pretty similar. This, though, comes up a lot in Rust where you have to deal with the enumerations and then the structure of matches and iflets. And it took me a, a bit of time to get used to that. I still feel like I don't quite know how to write it the most idiomatic way, but it's definitely a little bit different. So the second thing that I noticed in Rust, which was not so common in C++, at least the code that I've seen, is the usage of method chaining and combinators, especially when it comes to the types option, result, iterator, source, and sync. They all seem to have these families of functions you can call, which you can chain together, and can also manipulate input to, to output in, in these chains, so that you can do quite a lot in one statement just by chaining one function call to the next. So the third thing that I really needed to get used to, this is more recent addition to Rust, but very welcome that it's there, is the concept of futures and streams in a asynchronous programming in general. So it's quite a bit different in C++. So in Rust, I had to get familiar with the concept that when you mark something as async, that it is going to return a future. And then you have the syntax where you can wait on a future if you're running in the context of an executor. And along with features, you have the concepts of sources and sinks, which are kind of like the chaining of processing, but in this case, it's with futures. And this I'm still trying to get used to, but it is a very powerful way to describe a lot of asynchronicity in your program, and not something that you would see in, typically in C++. So that said, let's get into some traps. So these are problems that I ran into trying to write my own code where I kind of scratch my head, bang my head against the wall a few times. And after I ran into the same kinds of mistakes multiple times, I kind of got used to what was the, what's the common misconception that I had. So number one, unintentional moves. So this comes from, I believe, the fact that in C++, 
you usually don't move data. You're usually either passing references or you are passing copies. Whereas in Rust, the default semantics is move. So I tended to write code like this, where I said, let me take the self.state and let me match it against this uh, variant, see if it's an open state. And then I would run into this problem. I can't move out of self state. And I'd be like, what the heck? I'm not trying to move anything. And then I had to remember that, yes, you need to borrow that state and its contents. Otherwise, you're going to be plucking it out. And you can't do that when the state is the, of a member of a larger object. So similarly, if we're actually going to be looking at something in order to modify it, I ha you have to borrow it mutably so that you can change its contents. And this misconception I had learning Rust comes from the fact that in C++, there really is no difference in the caller's point of view, whether you're borrowing mutably or not. You don't have to add that MUT syntax token. All right, second trap that I found myself running into a lot. This might be familiar to some of you. It is the multi-borrow problem where you are running afoul of the borrow checker because you have the same object with many pieces and you're trying to use many pieces at the same time, particularly if you're going to be using a structure which has a function implementation and then you try to pass some of itself to that function. So we get this error message that I come to realize as a sign that I am doing a multi-borrow. So one solution, of course, is to not borrow for the duration of the function call, but borrow it just long enough to get a copy or a clone. So we're still doing the same number of allocations, but we moved it into the caller instead of the callee and kind of separated the two borrows out. All right, the third kind of trap, and this is the, the most uh, hairy kind of trap that I re continue to run into, is borrows escaping closures. So in C++, they call closures lambda expressions or anonymous functions and they're a lot more loose so you can go right ahead and hold a reference forever when you shouldn't and the compiler doesn't care in rust it cares a lot so here's an example where we have a closure that is going to be mutating a variable which is a string and this is fine right this doesn't have any compiler errors because we are going to be using the closure and then not needing it again at the point at the last line there where we're going to be printing out the name. The moment that you introduce another use for that name, another borrow, you get into this problem where you have the variable borrowed inside the closure and outside. It gets even worse if you decide to make that closure asynchronous because not only now are you capturing that uh, reference to name, you are holding on to it much longer to the compiler's point of view, because this closure actually returns a future, which is itself something that doesn't complete until possibly later. So one way I've learned how to solve this and work around it is to use the ref cell or the cell types, which employ interior mutability. In this case, our closure doesn't need to hold on to a mutable reference to something. It can use an immutable reference and share it, and it's a lot more flexible. And at the point where we need to mutate it, we at runtime do the borrow checking, and all's well. So, key takeaways that I hope you get from this talk is that if you're coming from the perspective of C++ developer learning Rust, try to leverage your existing knowledge. Many concepts and syntax are the same or similar, but embrace the common Rust patterns that are different than what you might have gotten used to in C++. For example, match, if, let, and patterns very flexible and powerful tools. Method chaining and combinators used a lot more frequently in my experience in Rust. And then the uh, syntax that comes with asynchronous code, futures and streams come into play more and more in modern Rust. At the same time, you need to learn how to spot traps that are particular to the differences between C++ and Rust. For example, unintentional moves, multi-borrows, and borrows escaping closures. The key thing to, in my experience is to recognize when the compiler is trying to tell you about a certain category of error and see that, oh, once again, I'm letting a borrow escape a closure. That's what that error message means. Anyway, that's from my experience of learning Rust as a C++ developer. Thank you for watching.